This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. You know that genetics plays a huge role in our health, and more people are using genetic testing to determine risk for diseases like cancer for themselves and their kids than ever before. So I want to tell you about ORCID. It's the only company that does whole genome testing for embryos, testing before your child is born. If you're doing IVF, this is a clear choice now because now you can reduce risk for thousands of single gene disorders, including heritable forms of autism, pediatric cancers, and birth defects. Check them out at orchidhealth.com. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Razib Khan with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And I am here today with a very special guest. Uh, I am here with uh, an author, uh, cultural evolutionist, I think I would say evolutionist in general, uh, Michael Muktukrishna. He's joining me from London, and he has a book, uh, Theory of Everyone, The New Science of Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going. Um, I'm going to give a, a quick um, I don't know, heads up to uh, the listeners here who are going to be reading the book, I hope which many of you will, uh, that this is uh, it's a big book. Uh, the title is a big title, and, uh, th- and it really does describe kind of like the, the book's um, scope and range, um, you know, it's a quick read. So, you know, I hope you guys check it out. But um, Michael, uh, before we go on, uh, talk about your affiliations and then work back a little bit to your biography in terms of your disciplinary background, but also maybe a little bit about your cultural background um, because, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, you did put a lot of that stuff in there and I didn't know any of it. And, uh, you know, I think it actually does inform and color some aspects Uh, of your work. I mean, look, our background always does inform our work in some ways, but some of it was actually kind of direct, I felt. So can you just get into that a little bit first? So uh, I'm a a professor at the London School of Economics uh, in economic psychology, but I have affiliations in developmental economics at Stickard uh, and in data science. I also wear a few other hats. So I'm the co-founder and the technical director of the Database of Religious History, which I think at this point is the largest quantitative database of history. Um, and I'm also a board member at uh, One Pencil, which is a, a philanthropic project that binds the research that we do uh, with um, with philanthropic work in education in Namibia and Angola and Bolivia. Uh, yeah, sorry. Do you want me to? Yeah, you were asking. Uh, just a really quick question, because um, I are, is that the um, the the Turchin faction or the non-Turchin faction? That is, the, that, that's a history we don't need to get into, but uh, that is the non-Turchin faction. Okay. Okay, then go on. Sorry, now you just triggered me, so I had to, like, ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that- um, I got to have a podcast about about um, that type of work at some point, because I'm super interested in that, actually, too. But, um, yeah, but I'm, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Peter doesn't let me say this, but, I mean, the project was born out of kind of disagreements between the two factions, but I was a... At the time, a second year grad student who is, you know, loosely involved, though, someone involved in that in that split. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, you have all these affiliations and, you know, um, your academic background, and your academic work is quite multidisciplinary. You're associated with a lot. A lot. Sorry, for yeah. funny, I, I forgot to mention one. Um, so I'm, I'm also uh, a CIFA Israeli global scholar in the Boundaries Membership and Belonging Group. That's a Canadian. Yeah. Advanced research. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're, so you know, I wanted to bring this up, and I want to talk a little bit also more about your, um, like you know, I, I don't really know, um, how do I say this? I mean, you're a third culture kid, maybe. Oh, that's no, right. Yeah. Okay, so because I, I, I like I said, yeah, because I, I, so just to, to give some context, um, I've never talked to Michael before. I don't know you personally, although we know a lot of people. Uh, like, you know, I know people who've been postdocs with you. I know your advisor, not personally, but I've done podcasts with him. And so I was at UC Davis and, you know, I actually did, uh, I'm an evolutionary geneticist by training, but I did sit in with Peter Richardson and when McElrath was uh, back at Davis. So uh, just for the listener out there, we have a lot of mutual contacts, um, but I didn't know like what you're not, I mean, I, 
I mean, I heard you talk. You sound like an American to me. But I was like, wait a second. Like, he's in England. And uh, you, I think you went to grad school in BC. And so, yeah. like, just talk, talk a little bit about that. Um, because I also think that, that, that along with your educational, professional training, which is not um, – you haven't been, like, a straightforward, like, you know, undergrad – biology or psychology and then going to grad school to study i mean first of all uh there wasn't really cultural evolution in grad school until like very recently so go on and talk a little bit about both of those yeah sure you know i mean these stories sometimes make sense in hindsight but it does seem to me like my interests are very much shaped by my uh unusually diverse childhood so I, my family's from sri lanka uh, and i was born there and i left when i was uh, two years old and we grew up in Bot- I grew up in Botswana, um, and that was a really interesting time to be in Botswana because uh, this was in the early '90s. Uh, so you know, I really saw South Africa, for example, which Botswana is just the northern neighbor. I saw kind of pre and post apartheid. You know, I remember as a kid uh, all of the excitement around uh, Mandela getting voted in and that the, the shift away from apartheid, all of that hope and promise, and then also kind of the the difficulties in meeting uh, that that promise, and of course we know what South Africa is like today. Um, and so then after that, uh, we lived in Australia briefly, but then we were in Papua New Guinea. And uh, I, I seem to, I seem to find myself in interesting situations because that was, uh, we were there doing a, a pretty important episode in, in Papua New Guinea's history, uh, which was referred to as the Sandline Affair. So this was a, this was a government coup where uh, the then gov- uh, Prime Minister Julius Chan, he brought in mercenaries because of a uh, revolt basically uh, from the army and this did not go down well. And so, you know, we lived about 500 yards from Parliament House. And like, you know, as a kid, I'm watching like folks in AK uh, carrying um, M16s, you know, driving down and uh, heading to Parliament House to basically try to oust Julius Chan. So it was terrifying, but also like it, it shapes you. Um, and, you know, then we lived in, I lived in Australia and then I went to grad school, as you said, in, at, in, at UBC, uh, British Columbia. And then my postdoc was at Harvard. And then I found myself to the UK. Um, in the book, I kind of tell the story because all of this, there were there were aspects of this that really shaped my my experience. So um, in undergrad, I I was always interested in big questions, and you know I got I got really good grades, and I was I think one of the top five hundred students in the country, and so I had like pretty much anything I could have studied. I was like, what do I want to do with my life? And so I was I was like, well, I wanna I'd like to tackle something big, like something in physics or philosophy or, you know, human behavior or something, but I'm also, I'm kind of risk averse, or at least I like to manage risk. So I'm like, you know, all of these careers are great, but they're not necessarily stable. So I should pick something that's a little bit more secure. So I'm like, I'm going to do med or I'm going to do law or I'm going to do, you know, finance or I'm going to do engineering. And cause I traveled so much and I intended to keep doing that. I was like, well, engineering is probably the, the most flexible of those careers. So I ended up majoring in, uh, I did a dual degree where I majored in, in uh, computer and software. And uh, then I also um, basically took a wide array of other courses. Um, in, I ended up majoring in psychology, but, you know, I took like econ, I took biology, I sat in on like, you know, philosophy and physics and um, political science. And I was really just trying to, trying to solve a problem that I'd seen in the world. And that problem was that we didn't seem to really understand culture very well. So if you, you know, if you're a kid, a third culture kid, as you described it, you grow up in all these different places. You realize that people around the world, they are fundamentally the same in that, you know, we reproduce, we eat food, we we're animals, right? Um, but we also see the world very differently and our cultures are completely different. We are running different software. And, you know, at the time, um, you know, we left, you know, Sri Lanka was in the middle of a, of a civil war between two ethnicities that to me, like as a kid, I didn't know there were different ethnicities, right? Like, I'm like, these are brown people and, oh, they're, they don't like each other. I'm not sure what this is about. And I mean, like one hilarious story is like, I remember as a kid hearing that like a lot of wars were fought over oil. And, uh, you know, this was, this was, uh, George H. W. Bush, you know, that, that kind of time. Um, and I was like, maybe this is what's going on here. I have noticed like some people seem to use oil in their hair more than the other group. So maybe this is what the fight is all about. It's, it's ultimately about oil. Uh, and then I realized, Oh, these are like two groups that from the outside. And even to me, they seem like the same people and they they're at each other's throats, the Tamils and the Sinhalese. Why is that? And then of course, you know, being in, in Botswana where you've got kind of South Africa, uh, you've got all this ethnic conflict. And then you've got Botswana that's like quite stable, very successful what's happening there. And then New Guinea, where you have, 
a place that looked like Australia in terms of its parliamentary institutions, but completely uh, not achieving the the kind of outcomes that Australia was and massive amounts of tribalism where they have like pidgin as a common language, but really, you know, even my friends at school, like they, they speak very different languages. I think it's the most uh, linguistically diverse place on earth. So yeah, yeah you're trying to reconcile this. Uh, I can keep going. I can tell my life. No, I, it's so you are, um, you know, you're the people you work with are often associated with as authors. Uh, yeah, was, was Manvi, thing was he a yeah he was a, he was a he was a he was a grad student when i was a postdoc at harvard yeah and so he's 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 been on this podcast and they're often anthropologists and as i was reading your book i thought well he was he he was already trained as an anthropologist before he like was an adult yeah right i right, mean to say <laughs> i mean you were literally in papua new guinea where a lot of anthropologists go because of cultural diversity you know, so as yeah. a kid, you know, as a kid, I remember uh, like a, one of the pivotal moments, or like a, a real moment that I remember was when I met uh, the Bushmen, like the Kung San in the Kalahari. Like we used to go camping in the Kalahari all the time, and often your 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 car gets stuck. One time it was stuck, like really bad, and so we, you know, another car passed by. They tried to help us out. We're like, we're gonna have to get some folks to like help lift this thing out. And they're like, we know, I know a community who lives nearby. So off they went and we had all these Bushmen just come by and they're hanging out with us. And we lift the car out. Well, obviously I was a kid. I wasn't doing this, but um, paid them with a bottle of Johnny Walker and whatever snacks we had. Um, but just hanging out and realizing like, oh man, people around the world are very different. And if you live in one place, you just don't see that. And so much foreign policy, so much uh, international relations, all of this is based on flawed premises, flawed assumptions about the world that are that are they're overlaid on other peoples who think very differently yeah yeah let me um i want to mention something really quickly um this is not part of the notes so uh you know we'll get back into it but um actually two days before we're recording this uh paper just came out i think it's in cell um it's titled reconstructing the population history of sinhalese the major ethnic group in sri lanka Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, so I've been waiting for a paper about Sri Lanka for a while. Cause we have Sri Lanka Tamil samples. They're part of the thousand genomes. A lot of listeners will know that. Uh, but we haven't had any, um, Sinhali samples forever. And so just so the listeners know, um, Sri Lanka is multi-ethnic. Uh, there's a lot of you know, small ethnicities, which I'm not going to mention here, like the Moors and other things, um, that are mentioned in the paper. But, um, you know, what Michael's talking about, there's the Sinhalese, uh, who speak an Indo-European language, uh, Indo-Aryan language. Uh, they're most of the island. They're Buddhist, mostly. Uh, and then you have um, the, the Tamils of Sri Lanka, who've been there for a long time as well, the Sri Lanka Tamils, as opposed to the migrant group. So let's separate that out. And these two groups have been fighting. The Tamils are mostly Hindu, although some of them are Christian too. Um, and then obviously there was some Dutch um, you know, colonial period. And Michael, you mentioned that you have some Dutch ancestry. So a lot of people in Sri Lanka have like, oh, a little bit of Dutch, a little bit of Portuguese and stuff like that. And um, you know, you're brown. You know, you, I mean, I've, I've talked to people from Sri Lanka before, especially people who are Buddhists and Halis. And you know, I don't get it, but like, they think they're very different than other people that look just like them from the mainland. Which is fine. Like, actually, you are quite different. Like, if you look at the social, if you look at the vital stats, uh, Sri Lanka is much more developed, candidly. Its HDI is much higher, even though they look just, people in Sri Lanka look just like people to the north on the mainland. The HDI is much different. It's obviously mostly a Buddhist island, uh, Theravada Buddhist, um, and all that stuff. Okay. Um, but, like, these two groups are engaging in a pretty intense violence. Um, you know, Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, was killed in a suicide bombing that was fomented or, you know, underwritten, I guess I would say, by the Tamil Tigers, who, you know, kind of popularized suicide bombing, actually. Um, they were the innovators. Uh, just like Arabic numerals are, are actually originally from Indian subcontinent, um, you know, suicide bombing was pioneered <laughs> by, by Indian people before it was taken up by other populations, you know? So there's some serious violence here. Um, I don't want to get into the political issues, but uh, you know, you could say genocide. There was a recent civil war that ended with a lot of conflict. So these people look look very similar to each other. So it must be a little confusing. And, uh, you know, on the mainland, there was a partition where Muslims and Hindus, um, you know, if you guys want to look at the like some ma- massive body counts, um, you know, we're talking millions of people might have died uh, in the late 1940s, you know. Uh, and the, again, these are people, uh, you know, Pakistan, India border on both sides of the border. There are people who look... Uh, 
pretty much the same. They're ethnically Punjabi. On the other side, there's Bengal, where my family's from. Although there wasn't as much violence in 47 for various contingent reasons. Like, you can watch the movie Gandhi to understand some of that. But in Sri Lanka in particular, I just want to say, um, I've looked at some of the genetic data from the Sri Lankan Tamils, and they look a little different than mainland people, um, Tamils from the mainland, because there seems to be less population structure. So in the Indian subcontinent, there's a lot of population structure, so you can have a village uh, – a village in India where people are genetically different as Finns or Sicilians because of the caste structure. Um, that doesn't seem as evident in Sri Lanka um, from the tentative stuff I've seen today. This paper pretty much confirms it. There's actually very little genetic difference between the Sri Lanka Tamils and the Sinhalese. They're almost the same people. So there's been gene flow that's been recurrent and continuous for thousands of years, but they've maintained their distinctiveness because of their language and uh, the religion. And actually, I think some of the kings of Kandy and the Highlands, like they were actually from Tamil dynasties, but they ended up becoming Buddhist and obviously promoting that Buddhist and Ali's identity. So uh, that's just a, some, something actually quite distinctive from the mainland, uh, where there's a lot more population structure and you have these Jativarna communities. And there is something like that in Sri Lanka, but um, you know, a cultural anthropologists will tell you that it's much more attenuated and it's quite clear in the genetic data that's just come out right now. Also, a minor separate note. Um, there's been arguments about the Sinhalese language and the Sinhalese people that supposedly came from North India originally, whether they were from the east uh, towards Bengal or Odisha or the west, Gujarat or uh, you know the Konkan coast. And genetically, um, there are now IBD segments, identity by descent, uh, in the Sinhalese samples that they have in this paper that indicate that they're from the Konkan coast, that they're from the west. So um, you know, here you know, not to be an imperialist, but here comes genetics uh, solving another issue for historical linguistics. Uh, you know, because um, you know, that, that's what we do here. So I just wanted to bring that up because, um, you know, you were confused as a kid about this. Um, and I think a lot of people are like, you know, come on, like, can't we just all get along? No, we can't. Um, and the reason we can't get along is actually part of, um, I think, um, the topics in your book. Um, which, you know, there is a lot of cultural evolution in there. We're a cooperative species, but the flip side of cooperation is intergroup competition and intergroup conflict. And I've had David Sloan Wilson on his podcast multiple times, um, you know, so I think a lot of the listeners, they know where I'm going with that. But um, this book is actually not um, a cultural evolution book in that traditional of a way. That's definitely part of the book. Um, in the beginning, and I want to get to this, uh, because, you know, part of your background is as an engineer, and there's a lot of engineer thinking throughout this book, um, and there are parts of it where I think this would not be written this way if it wasn't written by someone who was trained as an engineer to think in terms of trade-offs, inputs, outputs, uh, do some, like, rough back-of-the-envelope calculations as a matter of course. Um, and so can you talk about um, the energy revolutions? Because this is actually a book uh, a lot about energy um, which, you know, that might sound a little strange. You mentioned oil. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some like themes that are recurring here. Talk about the importance of energy because uh, in a way that's the beginning and the end of the book, even though there's a lot of other details in the middle. Yeah. I mean, at first I want to comment on that because it's something I've noticed. So my, my advisor, Joe Henrik, is also trained as an engineer. And I really only noticed this when I, when I used to talk to him. As a scientist, you're trained to kind of think about a particular problem. But as an engineer, you can never think about a problem in isolation. Like you always have to be able to zoom in and out of the system to understand how it connects to everything else because otherwise the whole thing breaks. And I think, you know, as a scientist trained as, a, like as scientists, both of us trained as engineers, we see the world a little bit differently. But let me get back to the energy question. So um, I started thinking about energy uh, through the lens of cooperation, actually. So one of the things I work on is, uh, is how it is that humans live in the world today where anonymous strangers from different parts of the world can live side by side in relative peace. And, you know, as, as, some, as some listeners may know, this is, this is a question that uh, cuts across economics and psychology and evolutionary biology. And in 2005, Science Magazine listed it as one of its top 25 questions for the coming decade. And since then, uh, a lot of the focus has been on identifying the mechanisms that allow cooperation to, to persist. So you, you probably know some of these like kin selection, inclusive fitness, genes that can you know, identify and favor copies of themselves, RB greater than C. Um, if you want me to you know, get into anything in particular, or just stop me, but otherwise I'm just going to keep going. Um, Actually, so, uh, really quickly, you dropped an equation in there. You should tell them what you know Hamilton. Yeah, so really. you know, so you know, so this is this is the uh, this is this is the equals mc squared of evolutionary biology uh, by by Bill Hamilton. And the idea is that 
genes that can identify and favor copies of themselves where the relatedness between uh, uh, individuals times the, the benefit is greater than the cost to the individual will persist. So for this reason, you know, a, a lion will come in and kill all the cubs of the previous lion, like kick them out, take the, take the mate, but they won't kill their own cubs. So across the animal kingdom, we see this kind of uh, um, favoritism of family. Let's put it that way. Love of family. Of course, you know, that limits cooperation to, to related individuals. Now you can get a little further through uh, reciprocal altruism, direct reciprocity, peer punishment, call it what you want. You know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, but uh, likewise, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So you might not like all the people you interact with with your office, but you're gonna you're gonna swap favors because you're gonna see them again. You have repeated encounters. You swap favors, and that's a kind of cooperation. But again, it's among people who know each other and regularly interact. And then you know, so you can get a little further through indirect reciprocity that the, you know the rest of us call reputation, which is you know I don't know who Razib is, but you know I know he hangs around mutual people, and so via that reputation, I'm like, okay, you know, I'll I'll go on Razib's show. That sounds good. Um, that's reputation still exists. And, you know, this is foreshadowing, uh, some of the stuff in the book, but not only does it still exist, but it was the dominant form of cooperation for a long time. If you've ever watched Vikings, you know, it's like, I do this for my name. Um, then, you know, getting, getting, getting kind of beyond that, you know, if you ask, an, uh, if you ask, a, a, one of my, uh, economist colleagues, he said, you know, what is it that allows countries today to succeed? They'll say it's institutions. You know, it's not that we're, you know, we're reputationally punishing each other left, right, and center or going after it directly. We pay our taxes to a government, a judiciary, a police force, and that's what does it for us. Problem solved, it seemed, right? So one of my contributions to this literature was to say, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. All right. You've got all these mechanisms and the lower forms are more stable and found across the animal kingdom, but they all exist at the same time. Plus, if you've lived in these kinds of places around the world, you know that institutions, the same institutions, like why is Australia so much wealthier than and more successful than Papua New Guinea, despite both having Westminster parliamentary system institutions, right? Why is Botswana more successful than South Africa? Like, why? Um, and so the reason, as I explained, is that those lower scales of cooperation undermine the higher scales under many conditions. And we call this corruption. So, you know, when a president gives a job to his son, you know, organizes some deal, we're like, oh, yo, that's nepotism. But it's also inclusive fitness or kin selection undermining institutions. If a person gives a job to a, a friend or a friend of a friend, we're like, oh, that's cronyism. But equally, it's direct or indirect reciprocity undermining our meritocracy. Fine. So now we're in this new situation. We're like, all right, so the lower, the lower scales are undermining the higher scales. Then how the hell are we getting to the higher scales? Like, why is it that some places actually are successful? So as I kind of was, you know, was looking at the math, working through these models, I was like, hang on, whenever we build these game theoretic models, we intentionally create a trade-off. But it's also quite possible, and it's true, that there is no trade-off in many things that we do. There are win-wins to be had. Sometimes when I collaborate on a paper or build a company with someone else, I can go further together with this person. I can do more than I would on my own. So why is that? Well, the rewards and what matters are the rewards and how easy, what the probability of getting those rewards are. All right, let's zoom to the present day. In the present day, we live in, you know, let's take the last couple hundred years since the Industrial Revolution, the most peaceful and prosperous time. Any By any metric you look at of progress, you know, uh, size of qualities, um, child, child survival rates, uh, wealth, uh, whatever you want. There was a massive takeoff after the Industrial Revolution that, as Ian Morris puts it, makes a mockery of everything that came before, like the Black Death, um, the Scientific Revolution, the Renaissance. These are these are blips. They they didn't touch any of these, you know, relative to what happened after the Industrial Revolution. So the argument that I make, or, or the only thing that could really have done this, and if you look across the history of life, you'll see this too, is energy. So what happens is there's a key metric in the energy sciences called uh, the energy return on energy investment or energy return on investment, EROI, e right? Uh, so this is the amount of energy it takes to get some amount of energy back. It's another term for it, or you might call it just excess energy. And excess energy is what we cooperate for. It's what we're competing over. That is what ultimately you know we want. So what happened was that during the Industrial Revolution, there was a bunch of stored sunlight in the ground in the form of coal and oil and natural gas and you know the cheap and available coal in britain meant that they could with new technologies industrialize and they could use that energy to become the largest empire the world had ever seen so a little corner of eurasia the backwater you know the time of the roman empire um eurasia has a nice big collective brain that little corner 
now energized by a, a, a bunch of cheap and available coal, was able to cooperate at a scale where they could outcompete other uh, civilizations without that level of energy um, uh, capture and without that level of cooperation as a result. And that pushed us into a brand new world. And so if you look at, you know, so we've built some models on this since then. And if you look, basically, the level of cooperation that is attainable is the level at which the returns per individual, per person, per, per cell, whatever, is higher than it would be in a smaller group or a large group. So if we're in a market where I can, you know, or, you know, we're trying, physicists, they don't want to have thousands of people to do physics. It would be better to win a Nobel Prize all by yourself. But if you want a large Hadron Collider, you're going to have to do this with thousands of others. If you want to start a business, you want, like, if you could do it all by yourself and keep all the equity to yourself, you would do it. But you can't. So you got to work with some other people. You got to get some VCs involved. You got to, you know, align with other people. You have to cooperate, in other words. But only if the reward per founder, per employee, per whatever is larger than it would be in a smaller or larger group. And evolution is how we find this, right? Like companies with too many employees go bust. Too few, they don't succeed. They fail, right? And, you know, in the book, I really take, you know, maybe a little indulgently, uh, please feel free to skip this if it bores you. But, you know, I go all the way back to the evolution of life itself. This is exactly what happened. So at the very beginning, um, you know, you had the moon sloshing the the warmed waters, uh, you know, across the land and back and forth. And, you know, probably I suspect like an RNA world hypothesis, you had self-replicators that eventually become life, right? And early life is reliant on the energy of the sun and, you know, maybe uh, volcanic heat or something like that. But over time, first you get, uh, you get efficiencies in how you use that energy. So you get innovations in that kind of efficiency. And eventually you get proto photosynthesis turning into proper photosynthesis where the sun, the sunlight, the photosynthetic uh, process results in little chemical batteries, little chemical sugars, ATP. And this means that there's a new thing that evolution can exploit. So new larger organisms cannot, they don't have to just worry about taking energy directly from the sun. They can eat other organisms, right? And again, it's, it's constrained by the amount of excess energy that's available. So again, you know, this is a pattern that ex it applies to cells and societies. It applies to bacteria and businesses. And there have been clear revolutions in the history of our species that have pushed us forward. And they, each one of them was an energy revolution. So the first of those was like fire, right? Um, the most compelling evidence for cultural evolution in my mind is the fact that we have a bunch of uh, uh, physiological changes that require us to eat cooked food and reveal that we had cooked food. and we don't have any genes for making fire. Like we, it's not in our, like we can't, like if you just take a kid out and was like, here, go make a fire. They can't do it. And it's hard. Even once you're taught, it's kind of a hard thing to do. Um, but our jaws are too short. Uh, sorry, our, jaw, our jaws are too weak and our, uh, our guts are too short for anything other than cooked food. So fire was an energy technology that allowed us to pre-digest food, process it in a way that made uh, all of those calories more bioavailable to us. It was the first energy technology. And it's the energy technology that led to a larger brain. Uh, and, you know, probably larger groups too. The next uh, energy revolution was a solar technology, not a chemical technology like fire, but a solar technology. And that was agriculture. So we, we had the, the, you know, we constantly, instead of like walking around trying to find grain or, you know, hunting animals, we started to, uh, to look after animals and breed them. And we started to plant grain and, 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 and harness the energy of the sun to do it more efficiently. And this allowed us to vastly increase the size of our societies, pushing hunter-gatherers to the margins where they still live, and eventually lay the foundations for the beginning of cities, increasing our collective brain. And then finally, the, uh, you know, the last major energy revolution was another chemical revolution, which was uh, the Industrial Revolution. And I suppose the one after that following uh, the Industrial Revolution was the next green agricultural revolution, where we, through the Haber-Bosch process, started to synthesize uh, fertilizer through natural gas and the, and the nitrogen in the air. Any ammonia. Yeah, and I and I want to emphasize here. You 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 alluded to it very quickly. Um, you actually talk about stuff before before humans. Um, it's actually kind of like a global. I mean, in a way, this is a global history. Yeah. Right? So I mean, you allude to like fermentation and then respiration, and so you know everyone out there. And I think there's going to be a substantial number of people that took biochemistry or, or you know something like that, or at least intro biology. You know, as you guys know, um, there's like dark processes like fermentation. Um, which they can work without oxygen, um, and fermentation is super important because you know alcohol and all that stuff. Uh, but um, they're way, way less efficient than respiration. Um, uh, but the issue with respiration is it needs oxygen, mm -hmm. 
which, as you know, in your book was originally a um, dangerous byproduct. Yeah. Uh, of photosynthesis of, you know, of, uh, you know, cyanobacteria. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it led to the first, you know, mass extinction, the great oxygenation event. And, you know, people forget like oxygen is corrosive, right? It's what creates rust and turns your fruit brown, like bananas and apples brown. So, you know, one of the, one of the big things in the book, you know, it's a, it's a, it's not a, it's a very modest title, you know, a theory of everyone. And alongside that are, are four laws of life. So these are, these are not, you know, they're not like Newtonian laws or something. They are like lenses to view the world, but there's four things that apply across multiple scales. And they are the law of energy uh, that, you know, this is what life is ultimately, uh, you know, competing over and trying to capture. And it's what, it's what constrains the size of organisms and societies and so on. The law of innovations and efficiency. So this is the efficiency with which you can use that energy. And then the law of cooperation. So, you know, the scale at which you cooperate, trying to find new mechanisms that allow you to cooperate as, for example, as an organism like you, you are, um, you are less a single organism and more of an Amazon rainforest, an entire ecosystem. And of course, if you run out of energy, you get weak and you get defeated by lower scales of, of, of cooperation, such as tumors or, uh, uh, or illness, bacteria and viruses, um, or you get defeated by other more energetic, uh, other humans who take stuff from you, you know? And then finally, the, the law of evolution, which is cultural and genetic evolution, which walks through the space of possibility. So I refer to this kind of space that is created, the amount of energy available to an organism or to a society as being constrained by a, a ceiling created by the E-ROI, the excess energy, the availability of energy, and a floor created by the efficiency with which you can use that energy. And all activity happens in the space of the possible. And one of the key messages in the book is that the Industrial Revolution shoved that ceiling so high. And you know, every economics, for example, came a lot later. And so a lot of the focus has been on improving efficiency, forgetting that there was a ceiling at all. And that ceiling is slowly coming down. So uh, one of the key metrics, for example, is like, okay, look at all the metrics look like this. But if you look at uh, oil discovery rates, in 1919, one barrel of oil got you another 1,000 barrels, right? In 1950, one barrel got you another 100. And in 2010, one barrel got you another five. So that means the amount of excess energy, that's, every, you know, that's, what, that's what drives economic growth. It's what, it's what has created this positive sum world in which we all get along. That space is shrinking. And so the only way out is to kind of push that, reach that next level of, of, uh, of energy abundance. So I, there's so much in this book, Rizzi, but you know, like another thing oh, no, no. Is, is like, you know, how, how abundance and scarcity naturally follow one another. So when you get these eras of abundance, take agriculture, for example, initially, that's great. You get mo- masses of new people turn up and those people are great because they can innovate new things. You know, they can now compete other groups and so on. But that also means that eventually the number of people matches the new carrying capacity, so the number that that agricultural society can sustain. And so abundance turns back to scarcity. And that's the world we're living in today. That abundance is turning back to scarcity. And we're still, for path-dependent reasons, obsessed with the efficiency. And may, you know there are still some efficiency gains, but that's not what the action is. The action is in finding high EROI energy sources and pushing everything back up. And as I point out, if you look at the numbers, uh, there's there's like three, you know, uh, Obviously, apart from fossil fuels, which are, which are running out, you know, if you've got if you've got uh, fast flowing, large fast flowing rivers, hydroelectric is fantastic. Like good on you, Canada. Um, if you have, you know, solar has some possibilities, but we've got some battery issues there. But the big one is really nuclear, and nuclear fission for now, uh, and nuclear fusion hopefully in the future. I mean, if we crack fusion, uh, the eroy is such, and the energy availability is such that we would be kind of the first. The first generation of a galactic civilization, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to loop back to that um, at, at near the end of the podcast because uh, I think the, you know you have a big vision at the end. I, I will say, um, as I'm reading the book, um, there are, it, it, you know, the world is unit. In a way, the world is interconnected and unitary. And, you know, as we're talking and we're describing these laws or these models or these theories, these are human ramifications to, like, break it apart at the joints and try to understand it. So you're talking about the E-ROI and this energy stuff. You mentioned economists. There's also – so there's thinking like an engineer. Then there's thinking like an economist. Like, a a lot of what you just said, we can rephrase in economical terms like diminishing marginal returns and inputs like land and resources and stuff like that Um, in terms of, like, increasing productivity – versus doing Smithian gains in efficiency, um, very similar processes that are with a slightly different lens. And then there's also thinking like an evolutionist. So um, we kind of like 
gloss yeah. a little bit over, but the earlier part of the book, like you allude to endosymbiogenesis. I mean, that's how we have mitochondria, which is like unleashing the energy, which is actually cooperation between um, some sort of different unicellular organisms that became multicellular organisms that became us. And so a lot of these processes are, um, these dynamics are recurring um, over time, over the history of, of life on earth. And I do want to say really quickly about cooperation, you know, and this is how I, I know you, uh, your work uh, through this whole cultural evolution field. And, you know, the, um, the question of altruism, you talked about William Hamilton, Bill Hamilton, um, and, you know, uh, Ulika Stokestraw has a really great biography of him, by the way, if anyone wants to read that and also read his collected works. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, that was, you know, he, he developed the idea of inclusive fitness, which was also kin selection for uh, Manyard, uh, you know, Manyard Smith. But, you know, the, the issue here is like, why do we have altruism, quote unquote, altruism? And then, you know, if you read The Selfish Gene and some of the, you know, other works, you're just like, okay, yeah, maybe there's some of this um, works like reciprocal altruism. A lot of the earlier models from, say, 50 to, four, 50 to 60 years ago, um, there was something lacking there. And yet the reality is we have the civilization. Uh, we don't – this isn't a war of all against all. Um, we're not hyper-rational in terms of, you know, um, you know if, if you lose your wallet in a lot of places, but not everywhere, it will be returned. Um, and so the variation there is culture. And so, you know, from the cultural evolutionist perspective – um, you know, culture is is part of the story here, the dual inheritance model, which you just alluded to and we'll get to. Yeah. And I also want to say here, um, you know, there's multi-level selection theories, which are, are basically like, you know, they lace your whole field. I mean, in a way, your field's built on that. So the, the level of selection here is at like group or societies. Um, and, you know, you were talking about, you know, okay, like if you could get the gains yourself as an individual – you would, but um, the reality is sometimes you have to be a group. Um, and so, you know, I can just say, actually, uh, I, I wear another hat, as like listeners know, like, you know, I'm, I'm an officer at a company where I'm a founder and, you know, we have, uh, we have a burn rate and, you know, most, for most companies that aren't like capital intensive, uh, the burn rate is mostly salaries. Um, and so, you know, you're always sensitive to your head count. But, you know, you need to hire good people to actually have your company do something that can bring in more revenue. And so the ultimate goal is obviously to maximize your wealth by increasing, you know, the money you're bringing in through revenue. But you have to spend money to make money. And it's always this balancing act that you're racing against. So it's the exact same dynamic so as you're talking. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, like, I mean, if you're a founder who has equity, um, you know, you want to minimize your headcount to as small as possible, but you have to make it um, as large as necessary to actually get the gains that you want. And, you know, at some point, um, I do have to say, and this is outside the purview of this conversation, but, I, I, you know, at some point, I think we all know that people overshoot, companies overshoot, uh, like Google, like all the tech companies overshot during the pandemic. And they had to have massive, they had to, some of these companies, this was the first layoffs they really ever had. And so they, you know, miscalculated there. Partly it's because you don't know what the future holds, et cetera. They made some, right. you know, so it's like you modify your headcount. So all of these dynamics are going on. And um, it's it's really fascinating. Uh, that's why the book is interesting. Uh, but it's also really complicated. And this is why I think you had to, you had to like, talk about so many different things to try to get at the same question. Yeah. Uh, and so let's, let's, let's talk about um, – so you mentioned inclusive fitness. So, for example um, – uh, the, the American listeners out there um, will know about the Hunter Biden saga. Um, that's inclusive fitness. That's what you can tell your friends now. You know, um, why does why does Joe why does Big Joe let Hunter get away with so much? Well, you know what? Um, Big Joe has an inclusive fitness. You calculate the number of grandchildren. You divide by one four, et cetera, et cetera, and you you get the estimate there. On the other hand. Um, you know, uh, Hunter has uh, a child um, out of wedlock that he's not involved in, uh, in their li- and there's like there's all sorts of issues of how the grandparents treat this child. Well, that's that's not explained by inclusive fitness. That child is as related, um, expected value at least, um, um, as the other children who are legitimate quote unquote children. Well, legitimate and illegitimate that is a cultural distinction, right? And so, um, you know. You know, it, you know, in Game of Thrones, um, I'm not going to spoil anything. Jon Snow is as much of a son of Ned Stark as his other sons, but obviously he's treated quite differently. 
and that's a that's a cultural issue um that's not a biological issue so there's there's other levels of selection going on and i i just i, I want you to talk about dual inheritance theory because um i think that this is important um that's kind of like it's kind of like the, the the center of the book uh you start um you start in a big macro planetary scale and you kind of do i mean let's let's be candid kind of end in a galactic scale um but in the middle of the middle of the book uh we're scaled to human societies which is not thinking small but it is actually thinking small on the scale of your book but let's talk about dual inheritance theory and um cooperation multi-level selection and cultural variation yeah. um and you know you study uh, you study a lot of things. We can say you study culture, but when people say you study culture, they'll often think, "Oh, um, okay, so he, um, you know, figures out like stuff about like classical music." You know, that's what when they think culture. But we're talking about culture in a very, very different way, and I want you to talk about that so that the listeners can understand. Yeah. So, I mean, a big premise of the book is that um, the human and social sciences are at a they have they're they're in the midst of a revolution that turns them into a real science. Um, and I use, I use examples of like other more mature scientists to show what is, what is happening right now. So, you know, like physics, for example, like we used to think like, you know, Thor is banging his hammer and capricious gods are creating world events and, and the weather or whatever. And then, you know, Newton and Maxwell and Einstein and other people like that come along and they write down a bunch of equations. And now the weather is still kind of difficult to predict, but we understand how it works. Like it wasn't Thor, it wasn't capricious gods. And as a result of that, we can also develop technologies, right? Like we can, we can land a, a spacecraft on an asteroid. Thanks to, thanks to those laws. Now, although Newton is a bright guy, he's trying to turn lead into gold, right? He's an alchemist. And that's because he doesn't have a periodic table. So for a long time, like the chemical world is confusing and chaotic too right? Like you mix like an acid with a metal and you've got gas giving up, like what's going on there? And gunpowder seems to explode. And, and maybe we can turn lead into gold. I don't know. But then once you have a periodic table, alchemy becomes chemistry. And you're like, oh, that thing that Newton was trying to do, that makes no sense. But oh, absolutely. We can figure out like protein folding and stuff like that. And then you can develop uh, a whole bunch of technologies. It's like you can turn crude oil into medicines and plastics and, you know, and, and, and all of the other products. Um, same thing happened in biology. Like it was very chaotic and confusing why some animals laid eggs and others had live births and the peacock has a giant elaborate tail and the peahen is a drab brown. Why? Who knows, right? And then Darwin comes along and then later the modern synthesis with Wright and Fisher and so on. And it becomes a real science, you know, like we have math, we have equations. Ecologies are still difficult to predict, but at least we now know the rules by which they evolve, they change, they work. So that is what has happened in the human and social sciences. Like at the moment, the human and social sciences are alchemy. Like they're a mess. Like it, it doesn't it, like what's going on in Silicon Valley seems unrelated to inflation, seems unrelated to mating behavior, seems unrelated to, uh, in a, you know, innovation, like all of these things, like why are, are, are some countries more successful than others? Why is there crime in some places? Like what is education, intelligence? All these things seem disconnected, but they're actually all related to each other only if you have an overarching theoretical framework. And that theoretical framework is the is what you said, right? We, we call it different names, uh, dual inheritance theory. So the idea is that humans are a new kind of animal, not so much because our brains are bigger than other animals, they are, but because that those upgrades allowed us to run a bunch of software that was socially acquired. So in other words, we are smarter than our lifetime of experience should allow because we, when we're born, we spend all, you know, the first a uh, couple of decades p catching up in the last several thousand years of human history. And that completely shapes literally how you see the world as well as how you think, the assumptions you have, your values, your behaviors, your technologies, and so on. You know, culture gene coevolution is the fact that genes are adapting to the cultural environment, like, you know, like for example, genes that can help you uh, do better in a, uh, in a market economy are probably being selected, right? Um, and culture adapts to genetic constraints, the fact that we are uh, an upright ape. Um, who, li who lives in every corner of the earth without too many genetic changes. And, um, oh, and it's also referred to as the extended evolutionary synthesis, because ultimately this was not, this wasn't like a, you know, let's use the analogy of genetic evolution and apply it to culture. It was just an extension of population genetics into the cultural realm. You know, uh, Mark Feldman and, and uh, Luigi, you know, Cavelli Schwarzer were of course, uh, population geneticists. Um, so yeah, that's a big that's a big premise of the book. And now once you have a theory that you know like that, which I lay out in part one of the book, as I said earlier, that means you can 
you can separate sense from nonsense. You can see the things that are more like gunpowder and the things that are more like turning lead into gold. And you can begin to develop technologies, in this case, social technologies and better policies that solve the problems that face us. You can create new solutions to, to old, you know, long, uh, to old longstanding problems. So that's basically what I suggest, you know, so like take, take, take me at my face value. There's still a lot of work to be done, but this is what we do know so far. Let's rethink everything you thought we knew. You are one of the first people to have a periodic table of people, a theory of everyone, if you like. Let's use it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way, um, so, okay. One thing is the listeners, um, if you follow the footnotes in the book, you know, if you follow, there's there's a lot of different fields you could go into. So uh, Michael just like dropped, like dropped a bunch of words, a lot of conceptual density. This book has a lot of conceptual density. That's what I'm going to put out there. Right. Um, so, you know, now we've moved from Eroy to, uh, you know, endosymbiogenesis, inclusive fitness, and, and now like cultural evolution and evolution as like a theory of the social sciences. Actually, um, you know, this whole idea of psychology in particular in the social sciences, uh, not having a theory, I think economics would say that they have theories, but like, that's a separate issue. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's a separate issue, but I, and like, I don't want, yeah. And then, then there's a whole like because we're humans, um, there are actually disciplinary turf wars and conflicts about the theories. <laughs> I mean, again, it's these recurrent dynamics. Like, why are the Tamils and Sinhalese fighting? Okay, why are economists and evolutionary biologists yelling at each other? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you cannot, you think you can escape these dynamics, you can never escape the dynamics, you right. know? Uh, it's It's the same, like, you know, tribalism. Exactly. Right. We, you know, we, we fundamentally compete with each other, but then we also cooperate and we cooperate to compete. You know, that it's, that's, it's, the, it's the same thing. I mean, so, you know, one thing I should mention, I didn't mention this at the beginning because I don't want to, you know, to talk too much about the biography, but I was working, you know, I was an engineer. I was working on like smart home technologies. I had like great job offers and interviews and stuff with uh, big companies. Um, but I was like, is this what I want to do with my life? Like, do I just want to make a bunch of money and die? And I was like, that's, that doesn't seem, you know, I'm going to die one day. I want to, it's like we were talking about before, you know, before the interview, like what matters is like, I want to do something meaningful. Like I, people are divided on purpose and pleasure and I'm a big purpose guy. Right. Um, so, so when I, when I, I decided I wanted to try to tackle some of these problems and I was, I, I felt like culture was at the center of this and I had encountered some work in, uh, in engineering called control theory, which is the math of feedback loops. And this was a big insight to me. And I was like, this seems like is what's missing from psychology and a science of culture. I didn't know much about anthropology at the time. I thought anthropologists were people who wrote travel diaries in the field or something. So I was like, I did not know anything about that. And so I was just looking for people studying culture. And I felt like if we could understand the psychological basis of culture and put that overlay that onto a kind of control theory framework, we could build up a science of norms and therefore a science of institutions and, and, and culture. Um, and so, you know, by chance, as I, I explained the story in the book, but I, by chance I ran into um, a book by Mark Schaller uh, on the psychological foundations of culture. And Mark put me in touch with uh, Steve Heine and r and Zion and, and in particular, Joe Henrik. And, and Joe, of course, had been already working on this kind of stuff. But again, like I, I never had any intention of being an academic. Like that wasn't, I was like, I'm going to go work for the World Bank or I'm going to work for uh, one of these big NGOs. But then I realized that's not really a good path to do this. But even so, like I wasn't, because I wasn't trying to get a job and I was very happy to go, go back to being an engineer. Um, I, I, I thought of myself as this kind of undisciplined or non-disciplinary researcher. I was just looking for tools to help me answer the question. So I took grad level courses and, you know, and obviously in evolutionary biology and in economics and data science. And, you know, at Harvard, I was in human evolutionary biology. And I was really, I don't, I don't see the disciplinary divides. Like I've got questions and I just need answers and I'll take the tools from wherever I find them to answer those questions. And I think the book, the book reflects that. And, uh, you know, I hope I did a good job trying to explain these different fields, but, but also I think this is also why some of the insights that come out of the book are missed because of, you know, the whole, the whole problem of uh, the blind men and the elephant, right? Like each discipline is like, I'm feeling the trunk. And have you, have you heard the phrase, you know, the, the edge of one discipline and another begins is what you consider signal and what you consider noise. Mm, so, no, I haven't. Yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and so like you know, for a lot of people, they're like, I, I got, I'm focusing on the trunk. The rest of that is noise to me. And uh, you know, another person's like, No, no, it's it's the it's the, what matters here is the is the body. No, no, it's the legs. It's the tail. You know, and so they think it's like 
it, it, you know, the, the world looks like a snake or it looks like a tree or it looks like a wall or it looks like a rope, depending on what they're touching. But only if you step back and you see how the pieces fit together, um, that's when you see the elephant in the room, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a result of that, I think my hope is that once you read the book, like once you see that tapestry, you can't unsee it. Like it's, it's, it's hard to get to somewhere, but once it's explained to you, then you're like, oh, oh, I see, you know? Uh, and the book is written so that I, I, my, you know, particularly the female field of human behavior is, I would say, untrustworthy. Uh, we've had some big high profile, uh, fraud cases, a bunch of just more mm-hmm. scientific practices. And so I'm not, I, you know, I really stay away from like, you should believe this because this study said so. And I lean more on here's the studies, but let me explain to you how it connects and how you can check it against your own life and then what you can do with it to double check it. Yeah. Let me, um, I mean, we have a little time, so I just want to, since you bring that up, uh, there's a new podcast, um, the studies say, uh, with Stuart Ritchie, um, I think you know Stuart, um, yeah. Yeah, Stuart's a friend of mine too, um, uh, but, uh, and Tom Shivers, and um, everyone should check it out, listen to it, um, you know, it's part of the cognitive toolkit, we need to be more skeptical, um, you know, especially in the age of Google, um, we need to have a little bit more epistemological hygiene, you know, you can find a study that says anything, really. So how do we figure this out? Um, it's a whole thing. Um, you know, as you're talking and you were talking about inclusive fitness and, you know, you want to make a difference in the world. I want to make a difference in the world. I mean, that's why, that's why um, you know, I do a startup, you know, because, like, you know, how are we going to, like, change things and stuff like that? But real talk, I just want to be rich and famous. No. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's different ways. There's stories we tell ourselves. Um, and, you know, uh, academics uh, will tell certain stories of, you know, you want to increase your H index because you want to make a difference. Actually, you want to H- H- increase your H index because, you know, everyone wants the bigger H index, you know? Um, and so I, I was actually recently reading, um, rereading, it's been a long, actually it's been a long time, uh, uh, the Iliad, the Lattimore translation. And, you know, um, as, as most of the listeners know, uh, Achilles is given a choice, a, a long life or a, a short and brutal one. And he chose the short one. And why did he choose it? Because, you know, everlasting glory. Um, he wanted fame. And that's how, that's how Gilgamesh found was the only way to get immortality. Um, so I think this is actually, in a way, an illustration of dual inheritance theory because uh, if if Achilles wanted wanted to have uh, maximize his inclusive fitness, he would have stayed at Skyros. He would have stayed at Skyros and you know lived as long as as Nestor and had many sons. As it is, um, the only son I think we know of is Neoptolemus. Um, he probably had other sons, so. But anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, uh, for the from the dual inheritance perspective, um, you know, people. Uh, in particular, men, to be candid, I think, uh, want to be the big guy and have glory and have it, your name last, your name, the na- your name, literally your name. You know, my last name is Khan, um, you know, and so I, I think Genghis Khan managed to do both, which is very <laughs> exceptional, right? <laughs> he got his inclusive fitness out there and, like, you know, the cultural influence. And so um, this is kind of looming over um, I think a lot of human behavior where, oh, we're not maximizing our short-term you know, I mean, so yes, evolution is always, obviously, it's kind of a tautology. We're maximizing our fitness, but you know, how we get there differs and, you know, we've stepped into kind of um, a box that's pushed us in a direction that's really strange. Um, E-Roy is part of it. You know, we've, unta- we've tapped energy. How do we tap energy? Well, we cooperated. Why do we cooperate? Well, you know, there's a whole story that, that goes into that. And um, you were talking about, you know, disciplinary boundaries um, so in the middle of the book, you know, you kind of transgress some boundaries going between like psychology, anthropology, cultural evolution, evolutionary psychology, cognitive science, behavior genetics. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I think one of, if I'm going to like remember, there's, I, there's a couple of things I will say that I will remember from this, but one of the things I will remember is, uh, and I've, I kind of know a little bit about this, but you illustrated very, very starkly. Uh, we are, we are actually more ape-like than apes. Talk about that experiment. Cause that's, uh, I think that's like something that'll shock people. Yeah. So, uh, in order to get this, the second line of inheritance, right. Culture, um, and, and not just the second line of inheritance, but one that's evolving beyond our understanding or our need to understand, you needed to have the three ingredients that every, every evolutionary system needs to have. 
So in genetics or a genetic algorithm, whatever, you have diversity, like variation, and you have some transmission of that information over time without too much loss of the information. Uh, in genes, uh, do that for genetic evolution. And then you have to have very, uh, you have to have some kind of variation reduction. And if it is adaptive, it's going to be selection in the direction of something that's better over something that's worse. So the good stuff persists and the less good stuff is less likely to persist. So cultural evolution works like this too, right? Like diversity is easy. People do all kinds of things for all kinds of different reasons. There are personality differences between us, different access to information, uh, different motivations, incentives, whatever. There's all kinds of reasons why people do stuff. The magic of cultural evolution is in the transmission and in the selection. So the transmission is what you're referring to here, and that is that humans copy things without really understanding. And there's lots of evidence of this, but I, I point to an experiment done with uh, by Andy Whiten and Victoria Horner, um, where they compare the behavior of young Scottish children with some young Nagambin uh, chimps. And what they do is they've got this box, right? And this box has a hole on the top and a hole on the side. And then an experimenter will take a stick and poke it through the hole in the top and then poke it through the hole in the side. And by poking it, they retrieve a reward. So for the chimps, it's a piece of fruit. And for the children, it's a uh, it's a sticker. So the experimenter, you know, pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side, hands it to the child, uh, so he hands it to the chimp. What does the chimp do? Pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side. Retrieve it. Happy chimp. Uh, again, the experimenter pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side, hands it to the child. What does the child do? Pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the through the side, and gets a sticker. Happy child. Now, in the key variation, the box is now identical, but it's transparent. It's not, you know, it's not a black box. It's a it's a transparent box, and you can see that that first action of you know poking the hole through, uh, poking a stick through the top, it doesn't do anything. There's like a floor or ceiling. All of the retrieval is just in that side hole, right? Um, but again, uh, the experimenter, you know, takes a stick and pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side. Now you hand it to the chimp. Now, if you've ever, you know, watched a chimp, uh, doing a, like a working memory task or like, you know, scrolling Instagram, like chimps are smart, man. And so what does the chimp do? He ignores that top action, goes straight to just poking the hole through the side and, and retrieving its reward. But again, with the child, the experimenter pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side, hands it to the child. What does the child do? Pokes a hole through the top, pokes a hole through the side. The child apes better than an ape does. It copies exactly what's going on. Now, later experiments reveal that, you know, children will do this when there's uncertainty. Like, they don't know why the adult is doing it, but they assume that the previous generation, now they're learning selectively, right? They're not learning at random, so they're more likely to copy adults. They're more likely to copy adults who other people are copying, who are successful, whatever. They've got all these social learning strategies. But the point is, they copy without understanding. And so you have a head full of recipes a head full of ways of thinking that you've never really questioned um, that are the secret to your success. You're building on the previous generation and you just need to tweak and adapt based on that. Some of that stuff might be wrong. Some of that stuff might be right, but it's still in there. So for example, some of it's um, you brush your teeth probably twice a day. Uh, why? If I ask you, well, you'll say something about, I don't know, plaque or, you know, tartar. If I ask you more about that, it's like, well, how does that form? Or whatever. It's like, I don't know. Has it happened to you? It's like, oh, sometimes I guess. But it's because your dentist told you to do that. And in actual fact, you know, it takes about 48 hours, I think, for the uh, bacteria to lay down. So you could brush your teeth if you did it really well once every two days and you'd be okay. Um, but you don't have any of that, that causal modeling. And you have actually what's called the illusion of explanatory depth, which shields you from it. That is that you have an illusion that you understand the world better than you do. And that causes you not to question these things, right? Like if my book, like think about, you know, even epistemic things. Like if my book was like, the reason that everything happens, you know, the, the reason that the world looks, the reason the right wing is rising and everything seems like it's more difficult for our children is because of evil spirits. You'd be like, aha, I know what section I'm going to put this book into, right? Now, it's not because you've like checked all the evidence for evil spirits. You live in a society that has goes, you know, that's not, that's not what's going on. Energy, that's plausible right? Take aliens. Like you lived for a long time in a society where aliens were definitely off the charts. And then the people that seemed like they knew what they were talking about were suddenly talking about UFOs and aliens like it was a real thing. And you are you can see it. You should be able to see it happening to you. It's like, is it? Is that really a thing? Like you, you know, you live in a world where you believe like hands down, you, you, you accept things that violate your everyday experience. Like you will swear up and down that, you know, you live on a spheroid rotating around a star, one of many stars in the Milky Way, right? And every day you see a sun tracing the sky from east to west and, and a flat earth. 
And you're like, nope, that's not what it is. Depending, it doesn't matter. Because the smartest people around you, most people around you believe this, right? You believe that germs are what make you sick, right? Invisible germs that you've never seen. And maybe you saw a picture or under a microscope, you saw something wiggling. You're like, that's what's going on, right? Um, if you lived in a in another world, you would you would just as readily believe that it was spirits making you sick, and you would just as readily point to the evidence of the person who ate the wrong thing and pissed off the spirits or the you know, the rustling at night. You'd have all of the evidence to back it up. But the point is simply that your intelligence, your ability to think, is a result of this socially acquired software. And that is what allows you to surpass your short lifetime of experience and your short lifetime of acquiring knowledge. You're building on the previous generation. Um, so yeah, and we do it because we're aping better than apes do. That's the irony. We're smart because we're stupid. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the big insights of um well, I mean other fields as well, but um of cultural evolution is social cognition. Um, you know, we have this like distributed network of information and some of it, you know, you know, so you said the secret secret of our success. You know, Joe Henrik has a book, you know, read the book everybody. I've done podcasts with him on my one of my previous podcasts um it's great and it you know it talks about distributed and you know a lot of it's like we have information that's distributed there's information in well there was information in j robert oppenheimer's brain uh you know and that was that really helped the the group of americans there was in, information in werner von braun's brain that really helped the germans uh, luckily there wasn't too much information in heisenberg's brain or not enough or he went the actually there was a stochastic element they went the wrong way but whatever right it's not all deterministic right um so you know when you break it down it kind of makes sense. And, um, you know, this also comes back to anthropology because um, when you look at another culture from the outside, um, it all makes sense. Well, not it all makes sense, but there are things that are revealed about your culture that you don't realize because you take your own culture for granted because the water you swim in. And so, um, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, he talks about um, cargo cults. And cargo cults have a savior figure called Jarm Frum. Uh, this is in Melanesia. And, um, you know, John Frum was an American GI during World War II. And there was a conversation between, I think it was a Catholic priest and one of the local headmen who's a big cargo cult guy. And the Catholic priest is like, um, you know, like, you, why do you guys believe in this John Frum guy? And, you know, the, the head, pre head, the head, the headman has like a whole theory about it. And the Catholic priest is like, so have you, have you ever met John Frum? And he's like, well, no, well, John Frum was like, you know, that was like a century ago and stuff like that. And the priest is like, well, how do you even know John Frum exists? And the headman looks at him, he's like, well, have you ever met Jesus? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that was like, that took the Catholic priest aback um, because, you know, the, the priest was using a, um, you know, a, a kind of like a toolkit that he wasn't flipping around to himself. Um, and, you know, this reminds me of, uh, you know, this is like a famous thing. There's, um, there was this uh, Muslim guy who was sharing Bertram Russell's Why I Am Not a Christian uh to a bunch of christian friends and they just they just pointed out like you can just make like a trivial search and replace that's a, it's a general argument and the guy was like oh and then he stopped sharing the book because he hadn't realized it you know and it just goes to show yeah we're really smart right. but we're also really dumb right you know as a species and it's because on an individual level we don't really understand all of these things. We're just good at kind of yeah. reassuring ourselves we do. Yeah. No, I mean, so what, you know, what, you've, what, you've, uh, what you're alluding to is this kind of idea of a collective brain. So for, what humans did was we moved the computation for figuring this stuff out to the population level by like selectively learning and copying the things that work better and avoiding the things that work less well. We filter every generation the good stuff. And, you know, for the most part, as we make mistakes, we get rid of the stuff that doesn't work very well. Right. Um, and this is, this is the, this is the big thing. Like, like science, for example, doesn't work. You know, Dawkins also has a story of like, um, you know, there was a scientist and he was presented with, uh, with the evidence that, that knocked down his entire lifetime of work. And then he goes, my mind has changed and everybody clapped. <laughs> you know? That's not normally what happens if it ever happens at all, right? Like scientists don't change their minds because, you know, the evidence changes. They change their minds or, or at least we discover truth. We slowly converge on truth because we are incentivized to show other scientists that they're wrong. And we have common standards for evidence and theory and whatever. Um, and as a result of that, over time, science works as a community not as a result of individual scientists running, you know, A, B control, you know, RCT, you know, randomized control trials. Um, 
So that collective intelligence perspective, again, offers, it comes out of this theory of everyone, cultural evolution, dual inheritance, and it gives you new levers for thinking about how to increase innovation rates. Because if mm-hmm. it's not happening at an individual level, then it's not about finding the 10x engineers or the 10x scientists who are 10 times better. That's part of it. But what you really want are like individuals that can be turned into 10x teams or potentially a bunch of 10x engineers that can be turned into a 100x team. Yeah. So you, you're thinking about, how do we increase things like sociality, like size and interconnectedness? And how do we increase and improve the flow of information between people? How do we get rid of the things that are halting the flow of information between people? Um, you know, how do we manage diversity? Because diversity is a double-edged sword, right? It divides people and it is fuel for recombination for new innovations. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is, you know, you mentioned startups. So, you know, I, I run a service line of the LSE Culturalytic where I, I basically offer this for companies doing this. Um, but it's yeah. <laughs> at the population level, you know? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't think I want to talk about it because, like, you know, we have a finite amount of time. The book has, like, a lot of different elements, though. This is a, a, an energy book. It's an evolution book. It's also a business book. Um, <laughs> so there's, like, a whole section about your consulting. And I don't I'm – not, I'm not going to talk too much about that because, again, like, there's a finite amount of time. And obviously I think most of my listeners are – uh, more interested in the evolution of the energy part than the business part. But, you know, industrial psychology, that's a whole field and you want to optimize. And, you know, if you're in business, if you're in a firm, you're trying to maximize some things. Um, but, I, you know, I want to talk about, we've been talking about cooperation, increasing complexity uh, and all that stuff. Um, but one of my, actually, I'm not sure for my first, but the first paper on cultural evolution I read was actually Joe Henrik's paper about Tasmanians. Mm. Um, and I, I actually got to this paper because i was thinking i read richard klein's book on the origin of modern humans and the punctuated equilibrium origin of culture and language and all this and i you know i don't i don't want to say i don't want believe in punctuated equilibrium i'm skeptical of it anyway so i was like uh like could could culture like emerge like in such a punctuated fashion and then i stumbled on the tasmanians who had a very simple culture um but um we pretty much know that they were i mean not we pretty much, we know they were modern humans and we know they're descended from the out of Africa migration 60,000 years ago, but their culture was, was quite, quite primitive to the point where, uh, you know, European uh, physical anthropologists were like, you know, are these archaic humans? Are they primitive? Like a, a offshoot of homo that's not homo sapiens, all these questions. Uh, we know that that's not true, but the reason that they came to those inferences is because the way they lived was considerably more primitive than say the aboriginals of the mainland. And can you talk about why they were so primitive? Yeah. So, I mean, just, just to reemphasize that, you know, they, rather than boats, they were kind of pushing rafts through the water. Uh, you know, they would rub fat on their bodies to stay warm. You know, they'd lost some fire making abilities. Like it was, it was bad. And, and what was interesting is it, it wasn't just that they had, le- had a less sophisticated technological toolkit than their cousins on the mainland, but also than their own ancestors. And this was a big part of, you know, the big part of it. And this was actually my, my first, my first paper was uh, experimentally demonstrating how this happens. So as, as you rightly said, you know, so Henrik has this model and there's, there's really two models out there to explain what was going on. Um, one model is, is a cultural drift model. So the idea is simply like when a population shrinks, you lose stuff, you know, like just by chance in the same way that you lose genes. If you're a, if you're a small population and you've got one person with blue eyes or something and over, you know, you keep losing the blue eyed people. Eventually there's no blue eyes left. Right. In the same way, if you have a small population and one, you know, three people know how to make a fire and by chance three of them die or over a couple of generations, then you lose that ability. Joe's explanation was slightly different. He said, well, actually learning is lossy. That is, be- remember, the light of knowledge has to be passed on. Like we have to teach the fire making skills and the computers and the spacecrafts and everything to every successive generation. And if you break that line somehow in some way, because you don't have written text or whatever, then you are going to substantially reduce the cultural corpus. You're going to reduce the, 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 the technological sophistication. And as well as that, because part of that software is running your operating system for thinking, you're going to be less bright as a result of that too. So that's basically what happens. So Tasmania, uh, so this is, this is what we call this a treadmill model. And the basic idea is that if learning is lossy, it means that a particular population size can sustain a particular level of cultural complexity in the absence of other things, as I said, like writing, that um, where generation by generation, you can reliably have at least one other person to replace each person carrying each different skill, each generation. So it's not things are lost at random. It's the things that are more complex that need to be transmitted are more likely to be lost and so on. 
So I pitted these two models against each other uh, in an experiment. And what happened in Tasmania, oh, sorry, I pitted these two models against each other in an experiment. It was pretty clear, holding population size constant, if you lose interconnectivity, then the you, you just can't transmit that stuff generationally. You can't pick the best models to learn from. And that's what happened with the Tasmanians. When they got cut off with rising sea levels from the Australian mainland, they didn't have a sufficiently large population to sustain their toolkit, their cultural complexity. And so they began to lose it generation by generation. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. So let me, let me, um, let me like bring some interdisciplinary, like, I'm not talking, like this is like, it's just, I think, um, there's a lot of great ideas in the book. Uh, this is something people need to think about. Uh, we are, you know, we are modern people here. Like we're using magic to talk over, um, yeah. talk over flat screens across, you know, many time zones, um, with magical spirits and stuff like that. Um, and you know, I just, I was recently on a flying ship, um, that somehow, you know, so it's like we live in this, we live in a world of wonders and a world of miracles. And, you know, I have a supercomputer in my pocket when I was a kid. Um, you know, I have like more computing power than the world when I was born. Uh, all of these things, okay, that have happened. And so we imagine, um, and like we have like you know, shale oil and all this stuff, nuclear, and we'll talk about that in the end of the podcast. I want to get to that, nuclear especially. Um, but, um, you know, so I think we have like a Whiggish view of like increased complexity and stuff. Um, and, you know, we forget in the past um, stuff, you know, from the economist perception, endogenous growth theory, productivity growth was much slower. We lived in a Malthusian world, a Malthusian trap. Um, you've talked about that in the book, too. And, you know, people thought that there were, you know, great ages in the past, golden ages. And, you know, as a kid, you know, I was like, oh, that's weird because, you know, the past always sucks, you know, compared to the present. Uh, but, you know, that's actually a very recent thing. Um, the ancients weren't wrong. They were actually correct. Sometimes the past was better. Um, and, you know, um, if you read The Human Web, well, one of John McNeil's last books, the historian, the macro historian, he talks about um, the Eurasian web, a network of cultural centers that increased redundancy over time. So there was a collapse at the end of the Bronze Age, which caused like a massive rupture. Um Okay, and it did. It turns out that the, what the Greeks recorded in their mythology was a recollection of the citadel culture of the late Bronze Age, and there are, are some arguments that the that the early polises in the early Iron Age were actually smaller than the citadels because um, the the what well, basically the economic um, uh, system that required the, the 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 forging of bronze had to be larger scale than iron. So in some ways, early Iron Age Greece was a smaller scale society, even though they're advanced in other ways. So, you know, they remember these times where there are these vonaxes, these kings um, that they didn't have in the early Iron Age. Okay, so they had a gold age. Now they're in an Iron Age. And then there was a collapse, actually, you know, in the fourth, fifth century of the Greco-Roman world. And there was a dark age. And for a while, it was fashionable to say, oh, well, there really wasn't a dark age. And I love, you know, I love, um, you know, Brown's work on late antiquity, and it's great. But um, it turns out there was a dark age from a materialist perspective, almost for sure. Ward, you know, Brian Ward Perkins and other archaeolog archaeological historians have shown this. Um, and, uh, you know, material well-being dropped, coin hordes increased. Um, to a great extent, literacy disappeared. So I just had a podcast with Eric Hull, who's a, a neuroscientist, and he did a lot of reading of literature. And he talked about how... Um, one, graffiti disappears from the Mediterranean. So uh, even if literacy was low in the Greco-Roman world, it's probably an order of magnitude higher than it was in the, quote, Dark Ages afterwards. Uh, so graffiti disappears. Also, the writing transforms where the writing during the Greco-Roman period, some of it is quite personal. Um, so like Augustine's, St. Augustine's Confessions, uh, something like that, uh, was not produced during uh, the you know, early medieval period in Europe. These are the same people biologically, mostly. Um, outside of England, you know, but their culture had totally transformed. And um, in a way, they had kind of reverted to Bronze Age uh, modalities of using literacy as basically accounting. Um, instead of exploring kind of the life of the mind and interiority, which had occurred during the Greco-Roman period. So today, you know, we're just like, oh, like, why, why do they admire the Romans so much? Well, I mean, um, you know, Ward Perkins talks about the fact that in England, uh, the level of pollution in the ponds, and this is like something you can like analyze materially, the amount of lead in the ponds did not reach late Roman uh, magnitudes until the 18th century. So it took it took 1500 years 
after the collapse for the economic activity of like consumption and production of energy, which is on the cusp of one of the revolutions that you're talking about in the book, to come back. And so our own civilizations have um, regressed and collapsed, and our social complexity has decreased, just like you see with the Tasmanians and just like your model. And part of that is clearly having to do with – so you're talking about interconnectedness. Um, well, if the literacy rate drops – you know, all the great, there's far fewer great minds. Uh, in Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos, he talks about, you know, you can quantitatively demonstrate the decrease in the number of minds. Well, is that because uh, people were dumber? Probably not. It's all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, Plato called Aristotle, the nickname was the brain. Bro was a genius, you know, or like, I mean, let's like, you know, let's talk more of an engineer, Archimedes. Um, you know about Archimedes, if the listeners, they know a little bit about Archimedes because the lever, like that guy did integration with the mathematical tools he had, okay? Like, if, if Archimedes was alive in the, in the 17th century, I'm going to be guaranteeing that he's going to be arguing with Newton and Leibniz, okay? Like, this was like, this was like a world historical genius, but he could only do so much uh, in his time because of the cultural tools he had, which, to be fair, were some of the greatest tools for a thousand years because Alexandria – or not – well, he studied in Alexandria and then he went back to Syracuse, which was one of the biggest cities in the Mediterranean at the time. Uh, you know, he was supposedly killed by a Roman soldier by mistake. They didn't want to kill him. Like he, this, he, that, that, he was like, like a precious – he was like a human – he was literally a human resource. Like they wanted to capture Syracuse, but they wanted to get him. Because arguably, he would have been one of the biggest, like, plunder the booty that they could have captured, right? They knew the value of this guy. And so it just shows that, yes, the cultures change over time and between cultures. And that what you're talking about with the Tasmanians, it applies to us. You know, I, I do have to say with the internet, um, you know, like we're both old enough, I think, to remember before the internet. And I thought, like, oh, there's going to be so many great minds chattering on the internet. And um, mostly people are screaming at each other or they're watching porn. So, you know, <laughs> there's limitations on that. On the other hand, you as an academic, um, you know, you put preprints out there. Um, you have way too much email. And so there's a lot of noise, but there's also a lot more signal. So knock on wood, hopefully we're actually increasing the rate of innovation somewhat there. And so that's illustrating that principle. Um, now, I want to talk, though, about you have a whole section on IQ in there. And I want to talk about that because I know a little bit about that topic and it's like, you know, it's controversial or whatever. Um, so you're actually, you just explain it. You explain like what your thesis is uh, for the listener because uh, they'll, they'll, they'll know a little bit of it, I think. But what, sorry, what was it? Just in terms of like how IQ expresses itself within a culture and, uh, you know, like, I mean, how the phenotype emerges and how we can kind of understand it better. Yeah. I mean, so the... The, the take that I that I have is basically um, if, if you think about IQ as a there's a lot in this section if you think about IQ as like a measurement of intelligence and so I'm going to use them interchangeably but we, we know the difference there um, IQ test results are going up because our technologies are our ways of thinking our education our software has been improving right that's that that's what's going on with the Flynn effect and it's not like you know when people talk about like IQ tests are culturally biased it's actually a much deeper issue than that it's not that like IQ tests are culturally biased is that there's really no such thing as culture free intelligence so you can see this if you look at a few you know like for example um, numeracy uh, many some societies today and certainly our ancestors counted like one two three, and then many, right? They didn't have a full loan number system. But eventually we got there. We got natural numbers above one. And we did it with a metaphor that we then represented in our brains. So some of those metaphors were like stones. So, you know, calculus, then calcium, limestone. Um, some of it's like stones pressed into clay, so like notches, or body parts. So we use uh, the decimal system, which is an awful system because it doesn't translate well to binary. Uh, but that's because we have 10 fingers. And other other societies count on the 12 phalanges, uh, you know, each of the finger bones with their thumb. And, you know, others uh, count on different body parts. That's great for numbers above one. But even once we got there, it took centuries before the idea of zero as a number. And that is because we didn't have a good metaphor for understanding zero, right? Like zero stones is is nothing. And that means it's nothing of everything, right? And so it took a long time. And certainly negative numbers 
Uh, you know, this quote from like Francis Masary's British mathematician in the 17th, 18th century was like, you know, negative numbers darken the very, uh, you know, the very fabric of reality or something along those lines. And that's really because it needed a new metaphor for thinking that would give us new intelligences, right? And that was uh, the, the number line. So we moved from objects to position. And this allowed zero to become obvious and also the negative numbers. And then to so obvious that we could begin teaching it to children. And of course, once you can count, you can do all kinds of calculations that you couldn't do with just your fingers. Now, you, you might think that just by measuring measuring uh, things out there in the world, you'll get some insight into intelligence or something. But it's not true because we all live in a bubble, right? Um, not like East Coast elites and you know uh, academics in ivory towers. I mean, we all live in a bubble where everyone went through education, through school, which is a primary means by which we download a cultural package onto the next generation as efficiently as possible to try to avoid the Tasmanian problem. And by the way, this is also, you know, I think this is how we also mess things up and enter the new dark ages because we're messing up with our schools. But th there is a section in the book on that. But if you look mm -hmm. at if you look at this kind of transmission, that's um, uh, that's taking place. All of experimental psychology, obviously IQ tests and everything, emerges long after the advent of school and truancy laws that meant that everybody got this baseline of knowledge. And all of that stuff has now become instinctual to the point where we think all humans have these abilities. So take reading. You know, the Stroop test is what really reveals this, right? Like the Stroop test, you've got uh, color words like red, blue, orange, whatever, and they're either matched to the color, like the ink text is the same, or it's a different color. So like red written in blue ink. And you get somebody to uh, to say the color of the text and don't read it, right? And people struggle to do this. So if you imagine like a psychologist from Venus, you know, the anthropologist from Mars, the psychologist from Venus, turns up and like starts measuring humans, just taking a data-based approach, not a theory-based, no theory of everyone or anything. They'd be like, all right, so humans have, you know, a, a fundamental innate ability to read, but they don't have any innate ability, uh, color perception. At the very least, it gets overwritten. And you would be mistaken. And we are mistaken the same way about many other aspects of our intelligence. So the ability to reason is another example, right? So we, uh, I talk about some work that we have. So we, we replicate uh, some research that was done by the psychologist Alexander Lurie in the 1920s in Uzbekistan. So he wants to understand how education is changing cognition. And he goes out there and he does all kinds of tests, including like if P then Q reasoning. So he says something like, um, well, he actually uses this very question. He says, uh, where it snows, the bears are white. In Novaya Zemlya, uh, it snows what color the bears. Educated Uzbeks, white. If I ask you, white. If I ask my six-year-old, white. The people who hadn't received education were like, mm, I think brown. I've seen a brown bear once. Uh, I don't know. You know, like It's like, what? Let me just repeat the question to you. I don't understand what you're not getting about this. So it's obviously not that humans can't do this. Like we, By the way, we replicate the same thing in Namibia and Angola with a much cleaner natural experiment than, than what uh, Luria had access to. But the point is that like these are these are proclivities and entire new cultural abilities created by software upgrades, you know, new apps running in our head that give us brand new abilities, new ways of thinking. Now, that is not to deny like that there are uh, individual, you know, like there are genetic differences between people. You know, there are like Terry Tows of the world, you know, John von Neumann's of the world. It's not even, to, you know, it's not to deny the the role of, of uh, nutrition or the role of lead in your water, like a problem that we have here in the UK. Um, it's not to deny, you know, uh, pollution or your prenatal environment, whether your mother was drinking and smoking while you were, you know, while she was carrying you. Um, it's not to deny any of those other things. Those are all important for developing good hardware. Um, but Across time, certainly, and probably across sections of society and between societies, the software is doing far more than the hardware is. In other, in another way to think about this is like, if you want to understand pivot tables in Excel, uh, or you want to understand like you know uh, Chat GPT, it's not. It is in the CPU and the GPU, but that's actually not in the CPU or the GPU. Like studying the brain isn't going to give that to you. Sure, software. And so you have to think about how it's written and what software people are running. Yeah, so I mean, I think I'm gonna, you know, um, I think you bring up a very interesting. Well, I mean, so so obviously, um, uh, intelligence quantitative trait. So just like height, um, we know it's heritable, and like we actually have enough. You know, one of my earlier podcasts with uh, Alex Young and James Lee, uh, we talk about it. Like both of them study intelligence, you know, EDU, you know, stuff like that. Um, and obviously it's heritable. It segregates within families as well. A polygenic indexes can actually like predict rank order within families. You know, uh, one sibling is smarter than the other and it's not because 
sure. you know, um, so it's genes. But, um, you know, if you think about height, uh, there are some populations like, you know, my family's from Bangladesh, uh, you know, Bengalis are just short. OK, and uh, this isn't because of nutrition. Um, like um, you're tall, like you attribute it possibly to your Dutch ancestry. Dutch are tall, like different groups are different heights, even though they overlap. Uh, but Bengalis are shorter than like, say, Punjabis, you know, and, uh, you know, people used to say, oh, it's because of like nutrition. But if you go to England, there are people from, whose ancestors are from Bangladesh and people whose ancestors are from Pakistan. And uh, in England, they all kind of eat crappy English food. No, just joking. <laughs> but uh, nutrition is not an issue. And these are both also two groups that tend to eat meat as well. And Bengalis are short. And actually, if you do a polygenic uh, uh, index prediction on, on height, uh, the Bengali Bangladesh samples in the thousand genomes are shorter. Okay, so there's a group difference, but there's also overlap, right? And uh, but this only also totally realizes with the heritability in a Western nutritional environment, uh, because there's a lot more noise, lower heritability of height uh, in um, third world countries and developing nations, because nutrition is actually a constraint. And so if this is one of the things like, can you chew gum and walk at the same time? Can you juggle these different um, variables at the same time. So what you're saying is not, oh, there's a blank slate, but um, there's still the Archimedes of Neumanns, uh, Oppenheimers of the world, but that expresses in a certain cultural context. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I guess the argument is even is perhaps a little even stronger than you know than that. Like, so I have a paper on this called the Cultural Evolution of Genetic Heritability, which I think you might have read, and uh, it makes this in, in detail. It's got a nice model to to to, to back it out, um, but. The, the, I mean, the idea is this, right? If we all lived in a perfectly equal cultural environment, this is obviously true. Like, you know, we all had the same parents, the same, you know, educational environment, the same resources, the same nutrition, the same avoidance of insults like disease and uh, and, and whatever pathogens, then genes would be 100% heritable to explain, you know, intelligence, right? Uh, that's not the world we live in. And what's more, it's not clear. Like, so take someone like Newton. It's not clear. So one question some people ask me is like, where have all the geniuses gone? And my answer to that is it's not that their geniuses have gone. Like it's, it is statistically unlikely that Newton at a time when literacy was so low happened to be the person with the most genetic or, you know, the most potential in England. No, the guy was like the, the, the top of a small molehill and Einstein too, on a slightly, on a, on a larger hill. Right. Um, or to put it another way, the reason that there are no geniuses today is there's so many geniuses that none stand out. Right, you have to be like several orders more, uh, you know, higher in sigma, like way out there on the tail to be noticed. And even then, it's not clear that that ge that genetic difference in hardware is going to result in better outcomes for you because most of us are smart enough, and the constraints on innovation are no longer about like having more intelligence. It's like when you go to grad school, right? Like fewer there, it's not necessary. Like people are so like to get to that point, you're thinking intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. You get to a point where everyone is intelligent enough, and now other factors like hard work or you know the, what you're reading or you know how you socially uh, network or whatever mm -hmm. those other things are gonna are gonna affect your uh, your outcomes. So, yeah, like take yeah. the tech, big tech engineer or you know finance bro, whatever. Take them back to like England, and they would probably rederive like rewrite Principia probably with more stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to mention, I want to, I want to, I, we're running out of time now. So I, I do want to move to nuclear and environment and all that stuff. So the last thing I'll say on this is the average measured IQ in Japan is actually higher than in Northern Europe by about five points. And it's always been a paradox or a mystery. I mean, Japanese are, they're productive intellectually, like Japanese science and other things, but people have always perceived they punch a little bit lower than maybe they should be based on that IQ and what's going on. And like the standard explanation is like, if you look at anthropologists who study Japanese science, it's extremely hierarchical. And uh, so the famous um, uh, population geneticist Motu Kimura, he went to the United States because he couldn't like really publish his theories as a young, young researcher in Japan because you have to defer to the elders. And then once he got enough uh, status, he went back to Japan and then acted just like them, to be candid. I mean, this is well known. Uh, the irony of Motu Kimura is he acted just like his, his, um, his mentors in Japan when he got that position. But, it, it, you know, this hierarchical system, uh, it might be efficient. It might actually keep, you know, using your terminology, keep the floor higher. But the problem is it limits the ceiling. Right. And so that's just uh, just an explanation that I'm going to throw out there. To, to, it's awesome. I mean, I, I just want, you know, like, so take IQ test performance, right? In our, at our site, those without education on Ravens colored progressive matrices, which is about as culture free as you get eight year olds perform like 18 year olds. 
like IQ tests are measuring what education gives you. And, and because of the shift, thanks to the internet, which we didn't really get into, and I talk about the second enlightenment that the internet is creating, because of the internet, the future IQ tests, like the stuff that's going to matter, aren't going to be the same skills that we're measuring today, right? Like the ability to focus in a distracted world or parse through for signal and noise or work with AI, that's the stuff that's going to matter. Our education systems haven't kept up and the way we even think about intelligence hasn't kept up. Um, Anyway. Yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of controversial ideas in this book, which to me is not a bad thing. Um, and if you're listening to me, you probably don't think it's a bad thing. Um, so I want to like end um, this podcast with like a little bit of controversy. Um, uh, you know, you started out with like you know big evolutionary, like paleontological, whatever, and you know uh, energy is a big big issue. You talked about nuclear. Um, you know, you live in England, um, you live in Europe, um, England's still part of Europe, even if you're not in the EU, um, degrowth and all this stuff is big there. And, you know, in like, you know, professional managerial class, kind of like, you know, more liberal lefty, um, you know, cultural milieu, there's certain, certain assumptions about renewables and everyone should do solar and scientists are a little bit off the res on this. Um, but you know, nuclear is like, oh, that's dangerous. And, et cetera, et cetera. I think things are changing maybe a little bit with Oppenheimer movie. Um, Culture matters, you know? Um, it's, it seems it's sexy again. I'm one of the top top selling books is now biographies of J. Robert Oppenheimer because he was a womanizer, so you want to know about him now. Not, you know, I don't know. I don't know why. I think it's like, you know, it, you know his, he was not a boring guy. But, um, you know, I, in the book you're talking about, we are running up against, you know, limits to growth, uh, to use 1970s terminology. And some people think that's good. They think degrowth is good. Um, you have like a whole. You know, okay, I, 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 wait, did I just trigger you? Did I just trigger you? <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. I mean, degrowth is 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 such a uh, it's such a dangerous idea. I mean, you know, I talk about like positive sum and zero sum ideas. The idea of like like let's put a ceiling on this. Let's like an organism grows and then it stops. An organism grows and then it stops and then it starts to decay. Right? Like um, you by creating a world of degrowth, you create a zero sum world where someone else's win is your loss because the pie is fixed. And that is, you know, what we want, if we want to say, if we want to get out of this climate mess, we don't do it through degrowth or scarcity by encouraging that. We get there by entering the new level of abundance, right? The countries that are looking after their environments are the countries where there's enough money to do so. You know, they're the ones that can rebuild the barrier reef, like if you're Australia, or plant a bunch of trees, give off a bunch of land, because you're not poor and worried about like, you know, just like feeding your people and making sure there's enough, uh, enough resources for hospitals and so on. So we, by entering that new era of growth, like it's night, it's easier to be nice when there's more to go around. And it's easier to look after and want to live in a clean environment when you have enough resources and have enough energy to do the, to do so. Yeah. And so for the listeners out there who don't know, I mean, degrowth is not just a generic term. It's a new field. Um, I'm going to say it's a heterodox field to be like neutral about it. Um, it's outside of conventional economics, environmental science and stuff like that. And the whole idea is we kind of live in like a zero footprint world and we get OK with just kind of economically stagnating, maybe in declining population declining economic growth, like, you know, less resources, just less to go around. And I, I don't study it too much because ca- candidly, like stepping outside the neutral box, uh, it's pretty hackish. Um, and uh, it's one of those things you see like these viral memes go out uh, and like anyone who knows economic history knows that that chart is just a lie. Like I see that can- all the time with degrowth. I'm just like, all right, like, no, I'm not going to comment on this because it's a lie. Like, you know, it's like the whole field. I mean, I'm trying I'm being like really polemical here, but like the whole field is like a lie. It's like lie after lie after lie. It's like it's like cargo cult science. It's not real. Anyway, um, but like, you know, you really promote nuclear. And one of the things I have to say is you also promote, you know, to be controversial. It's like, OK, nuclear is kind of seems anti-left, but you also promote world government, which, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't promote world government. Oh, well, I mean, but, but you bring up world. I mean, there's an implication there that we need to coordinate on the global scale. Yeah, but you can coordinate without like governance. I mean, a big part of what I, you know, what I advocate for is this like distributed, um, radically decentralized approach. So it's the opposite of world government, in fact. You know, like okay. the, the approach, for example. Uh, and you know, I was in Estonia last week to understand how they were, like how they reached the top of the pizza tables. And again, it's radical decentralization. You know, it's uh, it's this idea of like each state of the United States as laboratories for for democracy, as Justice Brandeis put it. Um, startup cities of like Hong Kong or Singapore or 
trying trying many different things as a way out of out of path dependence. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, okay. You, I, I connected the dots there inappropriately. Obviously, uh, maybe I read a little too fast at the end. I'm just like, where is this going? Um, but yeah, I mean, so you know, we have a coordination problem. Right. And how do we get out of that coordination problem? And so, for example, for the nuclear, you know, you know, libertarians will often say libertarians and envi- this is where environmentalists bring up libertarian arguments is um, the startup cost of nuclear. And there are some like small nuclear reactor, you know, actually, yeah. like I, some people in Austin invested in some of this. So I actually know some of this, some of this. But, uh, you know, nuclear power requires social complexity and coordination and capital inputs. And it just might be a situation where. It requires state investment initially to get it going before you get to the positive sum aspect of it. I mean, energy-wise, think because it's such a high eroy, it it pays for itself pretty quickly. Um, you know, and we know that we can build these fast because in other uh, regions, the Koreans have been able to build it in the Middle East uh, under budget very quickly. The Chinese have like two hundred and twenty-eight reactors uh, in deployment, and as you as you mentioned, you've got small modular reactors, the SMRs, and micro reactors. So you've got reactors, you know, the size of a uh, a couple of football fields, all the way down to reactors the size of a uh, you know shipping container or a car. Um, and and we've used these for a long time. That's what's running, you know, nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, right? Uh, these are not these are these are established technologies that will already get us where we need to go, uh, and more investment in that area. So what I what I basically say, if you look at the technologies available to us, the ones that have the numbers are like better better harnessing of the of the fusion reactor in the sky via solar, if we can solve the batteries for solution and, and nuclear in the, in the interim for base load and for a variety of other reasons. Now there are issues with that, that I get into the book and, you know, hint, it's not, it's not like the nuclear waste. It's more to do with things like diffusion of these technologies. Um, but, but, you know, this, and, and of course, as I said, fusion ultimately, uh, and we have a startup ecosystem around fusion for the first time. So I am quite hopeful. Yeah. I mean, we, we have, we have, we have decades to go maybe, but you know, that's, that's how it works. I mean, yeah. things happen really slowly until they happen really fast. Um, I think as we're ending ending with, um, you know, I'll let you. I think, I think this century is fast, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's long, yeah. I mean, so I feel like, you know, in some ways, um, the end of the book, I mean, it, it, you know, we could be a galactic species or our civilization, even if we're not embodied. I mean, I, you know, I have a note in here, transhumanism. I don't really want to get into that now because we, we're running out of time. But I mean, I think. Um, in some ways, this book has um, a, a huge window, like a huge horizon, and it's about an idea of increased complexity, uh, of like you know innovation, technology, um, kind of a, a, a big picture, optimistic vision. I feel which like you know, hopefully you'll have a lot of sales in America. We're an optimistic country. This is the kind of stuff we like, you know, and um, that's what I got like at the end of the book. I mean, what would you say to that? I agree. I mean, ultimately, it is it's a hopeful book. It's an optimistic book. I've had, you know, some of my reviews offline say it's it's too optimistic. We're not that good. Like we're humans suck and we're going to beat each other up. No, I I, I disagree. I think for the first time, if we really if you buy what I'm saying, that we have a theory of everyone, a periodic table of people, whatever, we can do something about the problems that face us. We can understand them as never before and we can know what we as a species should be advocating for and where we need to go. So I'm hoping many people read this book and by all means, argue with it. Tell me where I'm wrong. But hopefully, if you realize, you know, if you see that that uh, that you agree with it, uh, know what we need to do next. All right, all right. Um, I think that's a, that's a good place to end. It was great talking to you, Michael. Um, everyone, check out the book. Uh, I'm gonna read the whole. It's this long. Theory of everyone: the new science of of who we are, how we got here, and where we're going. And honestly, um, like as I said, there's an aspect of the book where you talk about your business consulting and your experience there. There's there's dimensions in this book that I didn't get into because we have a finite amount of time. But um, you know, there's a lot of things in here. It's a quick read. Um, luckily, Michael's a um, a good, fluent writer, uh, which like that's one of the many skills you have. Uh, so you know, and you're also tall, so you're a big guy for a big book. Like, let's like keep the analogy going. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed the book, and I'll talk to you later, Michael. Yeah, thanks very much, Razib. I really enjoyed it. Great interview. Whole genome sequencing is used for adults and children every day to assess risk for thousands of diseases. 
Or can a genetics company led by scientists from Stanford is able to do this for IVF embryos? Now, instead of waiting for a diagnosis, parents can assess if their embryos have genetic variants known to cause severe conditions before their child's even born. No other tests can detect these issues so thoroughly or so early. So check them out at orchidhealth.com. This podcast for kids.